one of the big ahas in the book, but also with Parenting with Love and Logic, is let children make affordable mistakes mm -hmm. because they learn from them. Yeah. If you rescue them, they won't learn. And then they'll become entitled, and entitled people are never happy. Hello, lemon drops. Hello, lemon drops. We're just um, singing one, two step. If that makes it in or not, we'll see. Mm. We'll trust I her. think it should. Maybe our editors will we put it in. We got good editors. Drop the beat. Sierra. This beat is automatic, supersonic, hypnotic, funky, fresh with my body so melodic. This beat goes right through my chest. Nice. Gotcha. That kind of sounded like the um, the bop it, the the guy that voices oh. it. Twist it, <laughs> yeah. Pull it. Wow. Pretty good, huh? Wait, what? Right. Whatever happened to that? Twist it. Pull it. Do bop think, it. Do you think it's that's still a thing? Like, is that? Like, can I go to Toys R Us? Is Toys R Us still a thing? I don't think so. I, I, yeah, no, I don't. I, I think Toys R Us went under. Oh, that's sad. I, I don't know. Help us out here. At least where we are, I, I felt. I know there used to be one by us, and it's not there anymore. Huh? That's a good question. Toys are us, man. What a spot. What a spot. Bop it. Speaking of toys. What? That goes great into what we're going to be speaking about oh, today. Oh, because children love toys. Children love toys. What a segue. And we love raising mentally strong kids. Yes. Which is even though we don't have kids, the title. Of our favorite, Dr. Amen's new book. Uh, we are very excited to have Dr. Amen here with us today. And we just like dove into it, all things parenting, children, brain health. Because uh, last time he was here, we talked about. You guys may remember uh, that, yeah. you know, we have had Dr. Amen on before. We have. Fun fact he is our first repeat guest. And. We talk about it, but it's very fitting that he is because we both love him and respect him so much. Uh, he is just so highly sought after in this world yeah. um, that we just feel so honored that he takes the time to come and talk with us yeah. and you guys. Um, so, yeah, it felt perfect. Um, also, we've, we've become close with him in the last year. Uh, the Lemons Foundation and his foundation um, are doing some exciting things together. So it was really cool to have him back, and we hope to have him back all the time. Yeah. Um, this is his 42nd book. 42nd book. He wrote his Either. first book in 87, I yeah. think he said. 87, 89, something like that. And then he comes out with like a book or two a year. Like, uh, yeah. That's what we, yeah. I'm gonna keep Keep writing books. We'll have you back. I know. I mean, we'll have him back regardless of yeah. what he's putting he's out. He's unbelievable. But... He has just so much knowledge. I could listen to him talk for actual hours. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's just, even if you don't have kids, a lot of what was talked about today is applicable in your romantic relationships, your uh, family relationships, whatever dynamic um, relationship. I felt like a lot of the stuff he was saying was like. Yeah. And also it can probably give you insight. Like I know when he was talking about things, like it gave me insight to maybe I, you know, am the way I am because of, you know, growing up, like what my child life looked yeah. like. Um, but it also, if you don't have kids and it's, um, you know, it's good practice. Yeah. Um, if you, if you are a parent, then this is gold. He, yeah. he literally, he described it as, um, girl Tay asked him like, what do you want out of this book? Like, what's the biggest thing? And he was like, when you have a kid, you, you know, take that kid home from the hospital and there is no handbook and you are just terrified and lost and there's no, there's no book yeah. for it. And he's like, this is, I want this to be that, this yeah. is that, that guide. Yeah. So encouraging. So much wisdom. We love the man. And I think you guys are going to love this episode. Enjoy. Enjoy. Dr. Amon, <laughs> welcome back to The Squeeze. We are excited to have you again. Um, for people that don't know, since our first episode in season one, 
Dr. Amen has been incredibly supportive of le- all things lemons. Um, we have exciting things planned partnering with you, um, and you've just become a friend. So it it only seems fitting that you are our first ever repeat guest on the squeeze. Yeah, I'm so honored. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. Yeah. We are too. Truly, we just we love you and we love the work that you do. And yeah, it's yes. fun. Always, always a good excuse to have you back on here. Um, but we start each episode off with this little jar with a game called Citrus Got Real. Did we do this last time? I know. I'm trying to remember if we did it. Because when we first started, we would forget the game a lot. Yeah, we did. <laughs> and I know you were towards the beginning. So maybe we forgot to do this. I don't think so. Okay. okay. If you would like to pull a little question out of there. These are very, um, very random questions. <laughs> An icebreaker. Favorite emoji to use. He's like, none, get off your phone. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> <laughs> it really depends on who it's to. But, you know, I think it's just the hard one because I connect to the people I love mostly. Is there emojis. a color? Uh, oh, red. Red, red yeah. heart? Yeah, I mean, if I really don't like you, I'll use yellow, but <laughs> most of the people I choose to communicate with, it's red. That's I'm just going to send you yellow hearts from now on. <laughs> what would yours be? Um, well, I do like that answer, but like recently, like going off of that answer, I've been doing the hand one, like that, the hand That heart. was going to be mine. Really? Yeah. I've what... been doing that one. I've like transitioned off of the red heart and I do the hand heart a lot. Yeah. Um, but I also, I'm, I'm also pretty um, sarcastic in my texting a lot. Okay. So there's a lot of like winky faces. Oh, like a smirk or like that, like the wink. I'm trying to do it like the. The smirky one with like this, or is no, it like that? No, not the smirk, the full wink. The full wink? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, um, so last time you were here, we talked all about brain health, but really for adults. And your new book focuses on children's brains, which I think is super cool and a different outlook of, you know, addressing things sooner so that we don't have to address them as adults. Uh, before this book, you teamed up with Dr. Charles Fay, and you guys co-wrote it together. Um, and I'd love to know why um, you decided to write the book together. Charles is the president of the Love and Logic Institute, okay. and they have what I think of as the world's best parenting oh. strategies program. When my daughter, Chloe, who's now 20, when she was six, she and Tana, my wife, were at war. Mm-hmm. And I'm a child psychiatrist. <laughs> Tana's not listening to me. <laughs> yeah. And like when she's seven, they're spending two hours doing homework. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Tana, you did second grade. This is hers to do. Mm-hmm. Get out of the fight. And she wasn't listening to me. But Three other people recommended parenting with love and logic. Mm. And she took the course. And then anything they created, she took. And she actually became a trainer and an expert in parenting with love and logic. And it crystallized in this one moment at home where, um, Chloe, you're going to do your dinner. Are you going to do your homework? Not now. And Tana stopped and she went, sweetheart, I'm never going to ask you to do your homework again. I did second grade. And if you choose not to do it, you'll have to deal with your teacher. I'm not rescuing you. And if your teacher is mad at you and she loved her teacher, um, that's on you. And if you don't go to recess, that's on you. And if you really don't do your homework and you repeat second grade, you'll make new friends explosion. Chloe said, I never said I wasn't going to do it. I'm just not going to do it now. She stormed off. 20 minutes later, without any help, she did her homework. And no one ever asked her to do her homework again. And she's going to be a senior at Chapman University. She's the most independent, mentally strong, responsible person I know. 
And it came from love and logic. Yeah. But love and logic didn't have brain health. Yeah. And so um, that's why we teamed up together to create a really strong program using the latest neuroscience with love and logic strategies. And it's so important. And, and I realized, and I sort of feel sad about this, that when my older kids were young, I got self-esteem by solving their problems. Mm. But what I realized is I was stealing their self-esteem. Interesting. And when you do too much for kids, they become entitled and entitled people are never happy. Right. Mm. And so we spend a lot of time in the book talking about raising mentally strong, resilient, independent kids. And it comes from competence. Mm. That if you're competent, you feel good about yourself. Yeah. If you're not competent because you rely too much on other people to solve your problems, you don't feel great about yourself. And yeah. then you end up yeah. blaming other people. So that's the number one hallmark behavior, hallmark self-defeating behavior. It's blaming other people for how your life is turning out. Right. Yeah. And, and you can head that off when they give you a problem on board. Hmm. I wonder what you're going to do about that. Rather than run around and make sure they're not bored, which chronically stresses you out. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you're, just significantly less effective. Yeah. Right. What What are you, going back to the Chloe example, what do you think it was in that moment that, what do you think it was that like changed, you know, her outlook? Tana took the responsibility off Tana. Okay. And put it on to Chloe. Okay. And that's. And Chloe what... clearly wanted to go to third grade. Chloe wanted to do well in school. Um, but she was dependent, and I think in subtle ways, unconscious ways, Tana created that right. dependency. Yeah. Um, and when she put it on her, like the whole world changed wow. for her. And then there was another time, um, I don't mean to pick on Chloe because I adore her, <laughs> um, but she had like this huge fit. And we were going to go, um, I think it was Sea Enchanted at... Yeah. Um, the theater on Hollywood. Great movie. Grauman's Chinese Theater, I okay. think. So we're going to go like the opening weekend special thing. Mm -hmm. She had a fit. And um, Tana's like, you can't reward that behavior. So she actually got a babysitter for her. Tana never had babysitters for Chloe because Tana, she talks about this in her book, The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child Grew Up in Chaos. And she's like, was abused by babysitters and so on. So never had a babysitter. Got a babysitter that she trusted. And when it was time to leave, Chloe it's like completely forgot her fit. And Tana said, I don't do nice things for people who don't treat me with respect. And I think everybody listening should just write that down. I don't do nice things for mm. people who don't treat me with respect. Mm. And she's like, dad and I are going, you're going to stay. Here's the babysitter. And oh, by the way, and she told the sitter, you know, have her do her homework and then her chores. And then you guys can play games. And oh, by the way, um, you need to pay her for this because this is on your behavior. And if you don't have enough money, she takes toys. Stop. <laughs> takes toys. <laughs> but you only have to do that a couple of times yeah. before people realize they're not going to put up with your bad behavior. Right. Wow. I love that. Dang. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, in, in your new book, you... You reveal something that you say is missing from most parenting books. Can you give us a, a little clue to what that might be? Brain health. Brain health. N nobody in parenting books. It's all psychological and social. They don't talk anything about the physical functioning of their brains. Right. And they don't talk about brain development. You know, your brain is actually not 
finish developing until you're about 25. And I always say God gave you parents until your frontal lobes develop. Mm -hmm. So the front third of your brain, the most human thoughtful part of the brain, 30% of the human brain, 11% of the chimpanzee brain, 7% of the dog's brain is not fully developed until you're 25. Mm -hmm. So supervision is really important. Mm -hmm. um, and too often parents send kids away to college where they're with the, in a dorm with a bunch of other underdeveloped yeah. brains. Right. And it's, uh, it's often very problematic. I'm like a huge fan of keeping kids close until their brain's a little bit more developed. Okay. And so, you know, if we think of early fame with a brain that has not fully developed, yeah. it's a prescription for disaster yeah. for many young kids. Yeah, 25. Hmm. I know. I was like, how old am I right now? I'm older than that. I'm fully developed. You're fully developed? <laughs> yep. But, but think about it. If you started smoking pot, because that's a big issue we talk about in the book. Uh -oh. It delays development. So say you so start smoking delayed. pot at 14. Oh. Well, it stops this process of myelinization. So myelinization is a huge word. It's a really important concept. Um, when we're born, our brains do not have much myelin. And we start to myelinate the back of the brain. It slowly goes forward. So if you take a brain cell, a neuron, when you wrap it with myelin, so think of it like um, insulation on a copper wire. It works 10 to 100 times faster. So if the front third of your brain, which is involved in things like focus, forethought, judgment, impulse control, organization, planning, empathy, learning from the mistakes you make. That's maturity. Maturity is I don't make the same stupid mistake over and over again. Yeah. And that part's not fully myelinated. Now let's throw in alcohol or throw in magic mushrooms or throw in marijuana. It delays, damages, impairs development and so if you start when you're 14 and then get yourself cleaned up when you're 30, mm -hmm. emotionally, you're still sort of 14. Right. And I think it's so important to teach kids to love and care for their brain. I have a game in the book called Chloe's Game. Is this good for my brain or bad for it? Teach them to love and care for it. So the reason they avoid those things is out of love, not out of compliance. Mm -hmm. Because if you just tell kids to do things, well, they want to do the opposite. I mean, you know, in the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, okay. right? Don't go to the tree. You go to the tree, there's going to be trouble. Yeah. The next scene, <laughs> I'm at the tree. At the tree. <laughs> <laughs> we all know that Taylor is the chef of the household and I am on dish duty. I don't mind dish duty though, because our caraway pots and pans make cleaning and cooking so, so easy. Caraway's internet famous cookware is a staple for any home and comes in various modern shades to fit any design aesthetic. We have the Caraway cookware set in cream and it just really matches the vibe and aesthetic of our kitchen. And we love when the vibe and the aesthetic and the color scheme flows from the pan on our walls to our accessories on our shelves to our cookware. I also love that Caraway's cookware is made with non-toxic, chemical-free ceramic coating, so you don't have to worry about your food getting contaminated. Visit carawayhome.com slash the squeeze to take advantage of this limited time offer for 10% off your next purchase. This deal is exclusive for our listeners, so visit carawayhome.com slash the squeeze or use code the squeeze at checkout. Caraway, non-toxic cookware made modern. Okay, Lemon Drops, this is your reminder to make sure you're staying committed to those mental health goals that you set in January because resolutions aren't just for January. Yeah. They're for the whole year. Consistency is key. Consistency is key. 
Um, and one of my personal goals for the year uh, was to go to more therapy. Stay consistent with it. Stay consistent with it. It's very important. Um, individually, but also, you know, as a couple, it's done. Therapy has done so much for us um, as individuals as and together. Uh, which is why I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about our next sponsor, Cerebral. Cerebral is here to help you achieve your mental wellness goals with professional therapy and medication management support 100% online. Hmm. You'll experience the all-new Cerebral Way, an innovative approach to mental wellness designed around you. You'll get a personalized treatment plan from a therapist, prescriber, or both in a safe and judgment-free space. Yes. I love that Cerebral is 100% online because it's one convenient, but there's also no excuse. Yeah. Yeah. The hard, yeah, the hardest part um about going to therapy is getting your butt up and showing yeah. up. Yeah. You know, life gets in the way, you get busy, you know, and yeah. and then you fall out of the groove and you just you feel so much better when you are consistent uh with it. So it's definitely yeah, very helpful that you can do it all online because yeah, then you have no excuses. Yeah. You got no excuses and it keeps you accountable. So we 100% recommend that you guys try out Cerebral. To get started on your path towards better mental health, Cerebral is giving our listeners 15% off their first month of online therapy, mm -hmm. medication, or both. Get started at Cerebral.com slash podcast and use code the squeeze to make 2024 your best year yet. That's Cerebral, C-E-R-E-B-R-A-L dot com slash podcast and use code the squeeze. Offer is only valid on monthly plans. Other exclusions may apply. See site for details. Get going on that therapy. Um, I'm curious, like what, what are you, I mean, you kind of touched on it, but what are you kind of like witnessing regarding like mental health of kids, teens, young adults, like what are, and what are some of the like root causes to their struggles? So it's one of the reasons I wrote this book now. Mm. It's a disaster. Yeah. Um, brand new study, 54% of teenage girls report being persistently sad. Think about that. More than half of our young girls and yeah. women, young women are persistently sad. 32% thought of killing themselves, 24% have planned it, and 13% have tried it. Numbers never seen before in history. Yeah. That, uh, you know, That's the reason alarming. is social media is one, right? Because of the self-absorption that comes with social media, you following people and watching how many people follow you. Um, the bad food is another, the news is another, and the chronic stress and tension. I tell everybody, turn off the news, turn, mm -hmm. turn it off. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's my favorite. I hate watching the like news. <laughs> max 10 minutes a day. Yeah. It's the same thing over and over again. And yeah. if it bleeds, it leads because fear keeps your attention and they just, lead with that and yeah. if you watch the news in the morning you're 27 percent less happy in the afternoon and so so oh. if we think of social media the news well what about bad food yeah right a brand new study out just last week on ultra processed food virtually damaged every cell in your body and driving up here you know i must have seen 30 fast food restaurants yeah. and you know, it's available and it's not expensive yeah. and it damages us. And so Chloe's game, she and I used to play this game when she was two. Is this good for your brain or bad for it? Mm -hmm. I said blueberries. She'd put her hands on her hip and go, are they organic? <laughs> because non-organic blueberries Stop. hold more pesticides than almost any fruit. And I'm like, of course they're organic. She goes, God's candy. If I said avocados, she would go, God's butter. Um, I said ice cream. She goes, oh, I love it, but it doesn't love me. <laughs> that's so funny. But it's, it's, it's that, that's the mother question. Yeah. Is this good for my brain or bad for it? Yeah. That ice cream thing. I was just talking to my girlfriend yesterday and, um, 
I don't know what got us started on it, but I'm, I was born lactose intolerant. Like I've never been able to like have dairy out of the womb. I've been like that. And growing up, I always really wanted to have ice cream or just like a glass of milk. And we never had it in my house because my mom, we definitely ate healthier than most families, but also I couldn't eat it. So I would, my parents have it. Um, and when so I that's would, a sign of love. A lot of parents of kids who are sensitive to milk, if the other kids aren't, the kid just chronically feels okay. shamed and bad. So yeah. no, good to know. Good, job, good job, mom and dad. I'll listen to this. <laughs> um, but when I would go to my friend's house, they would have milk and I would like drink it and then I would be sick. And I kept doing that as a kid. And now I've like, because I couldn't have it, but I wanted it. And like, I knew it was bad for me, but obviously I couldn't think of the consequence of me being sick from it that young. Yeah. And now as an adult, I don't crave ice cream. I don't crave milkshakes. I don't crave milk. Like I literally like I taste it and I'm like, get it away from me because I now know what it does to me and how I feel if I have a sip of a coffee that has milk in it and what that outcome is going to be. Yeah. So it's really interesting that you say that because learning that, um, seeing that change in me from, you know, child to an adult is interesting. Well, I have a child who I'm very close to, who I love a ton, who I first saw because he had Tourette syndrome, oh, wow. which mm -hmm. is a tick disorder. He had both motor tics, he'd blink and shrug and just had all these funny muscle movements and vocal tics, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's coughing, puffing, blowing, whistling. And it really negatively impacted him at school. Mm -hmm. And the first thing in my mind is let's get rid of gluten, dairy, corn, soy, artificial dyes and sweeteners. Mm -hmm. And 90% better just with the dietary changes. But the first time I saw him back, he's clearly better. And he's sad. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I broke my heart because he was sad. And he's like, I just don't like any of the food. I mm -hmm. said, is that true? He's like, I don't like any of the food. So the next time I saw him, we went on a shopping trip. We're like, your job is to find 20 things you love that love you back. Mm -hmm. And we're up to now 175 foods. Oh, wow. And he just realized it was a mindset shift. Yeah. And he clearly doesn't want the ticks that make him stand out and separate him yeah. from his friends. Um, it's like, come on, what do you want? Yeah. And you want things that make you feel better now, yeah. but not later, or now and later. Yeah. Yeah. It's so crazy what food, what food can do. I feel like that's just even like the surface of it. Um, but I would love to know, obviously, we're not parents, so this is a very pre-educational topic um, for us. But um, I'd love to know how one's parenting style can nurture mental health, um, excuse me, mental strength or weakness. Well, and that goes with mental health for sure. If uh, you do the things we talk about in the book dramatically decreases the risk of anxiety and depression mm -hmm. in children because it's when attachment gets broken, kids get unhappy and they get angry. And so all of us want to be attached. Yeah. We want to be attached to our partners, want to be attached to our family. But when we're little, it's life-saving to be attached. So there's this need from a child to be bonded, to be connected. And when that gets frustrated mm. early, it causes a great deal of anger in children. Mm. But because they're dependent on these people, they feel guilty about the anger. Mm. And then they turn it on themselves. And when something early happens in a family, that causes this break. Um, when children are four or five, six, they think of themselves at the center of the world. And if something good happens, they sort of think it's because of them. 
Mm-hmm. And if something bad happens, they think it's because of them. So there are a lot of adults who mm-hmm. that happened to. They just go around feeling like they're bad people, but they haven't done anything bad. It's the rage and then the guilt about it mm-hmm. that gets suppressed and then it gets turned on them. So if you want to raise mentally strong kids, step number one, know what you want. What kind of parent do you want to be? What kind of child do you want to raise? And so if you know you want to raise independent, competent children, you stop solving all their problems. Right. But it starts with focus. What do you want? Mm -hmm. The second is attachment. It's bonding. And bonding requires two things. Time, actual physical time without the frickin' phone. Mm-hmm. It's so important. I mean, you can see whole families walking down the sidewalk or at a restaurant. Everybody's on the phone. Nobody's talking yeah. to each other. It's, I have an exercise in the book that if you do this with whatever children you have, money in the bank, mm. your influence with that child will go up and stay up. Special time, 20 minutes a day. Do something with the child child wants to do. Mm. And during that time, no commands, no questions, no directions. Just be with them. Right. And I don't know if it's true for you guys, but if I had time with my mom or with my dad, that was gold for me because I'm one of seven. And time was, my dad was gone and my mom was busy. Yeah. Right. So she would read with me once a week. And that was so important to me. But can you imagine the influence parents could have if they just spent 20 minutes a day? Yeah. And they weren't bossy or they weren't clean your room or they weren't yeah. critical. Um, my first literary agent, when I figured this out, um, I think I was 35. And He had a child later in life, Laura, and he's like, Daniel, she never wants to be with me. When I come home, she completely ignores me. He said, that's a girl thing, right? Girls like want their moms. They don't want to be with their dads. I'm like, absolutely not. You're ignoring her. I said, do this. And I told him about special time. Mm. And he goes, that won't work because he tended to be oppositional. I'm like, oh, great. You represent an idiot. Maybe we should rethink this relationship. (laughs) I said, do it because it works. And I'm going to call you in three weeks. I'm going to put you in my schedule and call you in three weeks. Get the party started. And he's like, all right. Three weeks later, I see him on my schedule. I call him. Dan, she won't leave me alone. (laughs) All she wants to do is be with me. As soon as I come home, she grabs my leg. She wants her time. No way. It's so powerful. Wow. It's so powerful. I had had an Oakland police officer who like didn't want to come to the appointment. His 10 year old was a hell, hellion, bad behavior, (laughs) beating up kids at school and all that. It's like, just needs to be spanked more. I'm like, how's that working for you? Mm -hmm. Um, Special time completely changed their relationship, especially when I got dad to be quiet. Right. He wasn't critical. The second part of bonding. And you guys know that too, probably when you guys spend time together. Right. Uh, well, I was just going to, I was just going to say, like, I feel like special time could be like for put any, any relationship. Yeah. I feel like that would yeah. be great for us to, you know, set aside that. Well, along time. with one, which is goals. Yeah. What do you want? Like with my marriage with Tana, I'm like super clear, kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship. Yeah. Always want that. Don't always feel like that. These <laughs> rude thoughts show up. Yeah. Yeah. And if I've slept and I've eaten properly, they don't ever get out of my head, right? Don't say every stupid thing you think, right? Know what you want, time, and then listening. Parents talk way too much. And there's something therapists are taught. It's called active listening. When a child says something, don't give them your opinion. Just repeat it back. And then shut up. Mm. And then they'll keep talking and then just repeat it back and listen for the feelings behind it. And it's 
gold. Special time listening. So I like to tell the story when my son was young, he came home and said, Dad, I want to have blue hair. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your father would have said. But I know what mine would have said. No goddamn way. No. As long as you live in my house, you can have blue hair. Um, but what does that do? It stops the conversation or it starts a fight. Mm -hmm. Active listening is, oh, you want to have blue hair. You're just repeating it back. There's no judgment, nothing. Mm. And he's like, all the kids are wearing it that way. Now, I've been to his school. They're not all blue-headed <laughs> yeah. children. But I don't know what your dad would have said if you said they're all doing that. Mine would have said, I don't care what anybody yeah. else is doing. As long as you live in this house, you're not having blue hair. If yeah. they're going to jump off a bridge, are you going I with them? I heard that yeah. so much from yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But again, what does that do? Stops the conversation or starts a fight. Sounds like you want to be like the other kids. And he might say, you know, sometimes I feel like I don't fit in. And that's the conversation you want to have. Mm. And of course, my mother would have said, what do you mean you don't fit in? You're a good boy. You're a good looking boy. Of course you fit in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not helpful either. It's like, hmm. And then just listen. Now, at the end of a half an hour, if you still want to have blue hair, I'm going to tell him no goddamn way in hell as long as he lives in my house. <laughs> yeah. Because it's not helpful to, like, look weird. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So supervision and boundaries are important, but kids are so much more likely to accept it yeah. if they think you care yeah. and caring is time and it's listening. Yeah. It's so crazy how this just like flows into every form of relationship. Well, we talked about it. You brought it up when we were talking with Dr. Judy, who is an attachment style. Um, Expert. Expert. Yeah. Um, and you told her the story about one of our friends with their child recently when they were throwing a tantrum, just, you know, letting them get it out, you know, rather than jumping in and yeah. being. He's one and a half and, or <clears throat> I guess he's almost two now. Almost so, two. Almost two. I, I like that. Yeah. Because we just talked about rage mm -hmm. and then guilt about the rage. Um the rule I have is if you throw a tantrum to get your way, the answer is no. It's always going to be no. Go for it. Mm. I have no tantrums. Yeah. Because, and what happens, they throw a tantrum and you get anxious and you give in to them. Yeah. So what have you just taught them? Right. To throw a tantrum to get your way. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. We teach people how to treat us by what we tolerate. Yeah. And the two hallmark words of parenting, if you're ever like confused at what to do in a situation, it's firm and kind mm. and do that at the same time. Mm. And if you're going to err, err on firmness. Whoa. 10,000 kids study where they looked at parenting styles and yeah. they looked across two dimensions. Um, firm versus permissive, permissive, loving versus hostile. And it gives you four kinds of parents. Mm -hmm. Parents that are firm but permissive, loving, permissive, um, loving and firm, or uh, firm and permissive. And the worst, the kids who do the worst in life have, hostile, permissive parents. Mm -hmm. I hate you, and I don't care what you do. Um, but the second worst surprised me, because you would think the second worst would be... Um, firm and permissive. Be hostile and firm. Oh, yeah. The drill sergeant type. But okay. it's actually not true. It's the loving and permissive type. The kids had the most problems. Right. And mm. it's not good to be hostile. Don't be hostile to your children. It's not helpful. But if you really want to raise mentally strong kids who feel good about themselves, loving and firm, firm and kind. Yeah. We've all been here before. We've all found that perfect dress to wear to a friend's wedding, out to an event, um, on a dinner date. Uh, but we all need to wear shapewear underneath it. 
And just when you're about to go rush out to do the cha-cha slide on the dance floor at that wedding, you feel your shape war start to roll up. And instead of doing the cha-cha slide, you are sliding into the bathroom, unrolling your shapewear because it's now super uncomfortable and you're trying to fix it. Luckily, I have a solution for you. I've recently found Honey Love. Honey Love shapewear has flexible boning that's hidden in the side seams to prevent any extremely frustrating rolling. This has been heaven sent because when shapewear shapewear rolls or it gets stuck, it's honestly doing more harm than good. And then at that point, you just want to take it off. Uh, But the way Honey Love shapewear is structured, it's comfortable and it actually works. And you're able to go out on the floor and do the cha-cha slide and go out and dance on the dance floor at your dinner date or whatever you're doing. Um, It's just, it's really functional. Treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash the squeeze. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off honeylove.com slash the squeeze. After you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them that we sent you uh, move with confidence. Thanks to Honey Love. You guys need to try out the shapewear. It's chef's kiss. It's great. If you're like me and at the drop of the hat can seeing any cheetah girl song can redo any high school musical choreography um, without a second thought then you're probably a millennial and if you're a millennial it's time to add clarence multi-active cream to your daily routine rooted in nature and innovated with science clarence has a long legacy of creating industry first plant forward products And even though I'm still in my 20s, I know it's important to take care of your skin no matter how old you are to prevent signs of aging. I've already begun to notice my skin has been more glowy and my pores have been looking smaller, which is something that we all love. Go to Clarence.com slash The Squeeze to get multi-active day and night cream for 10% off, a free welcome gift, plus free shipping on your first order. All of the above. That's Clarins, C-L-A-R-I-N-S dot com slash the squeeze with promo code the squeeze. Clarins dot com slash the squeeze, promo code the squeeze. You guys enjoy. Are there like any signs in children that parents could look for to be like, oh, maybe I need to like reassess my parenting style or how I'm approaching things? Yeah, if your kids are anxious. If they're sad, if they're acting out and um, becoming a child psychiatrist. So I did three years of general psychiatry training and two in specific child and adolescent psychiatry. Well, the first year of my child training, I did play therapy with these kids and I hated them because nobody got better. (laughs) <laughs> I was just like, that wasn't very helpful. Uh, the second year I did parent training with the parents mm. and the, the kids got better because mm. when I teach the parents how to act in ways, cause you know, most people, when they have children, they act as their parents acting yeah. or they're really unhappy with their parents. So they do the opposite. Neither of which is often helpful. Mm. Yeah. And you have yeah. to ask, you, is it ADD? Because ADD or ADHD, it's a real thing. And left untreated causes all sorts of problems. Or is it ineffective parenting? So the first thing when you have an ADD or ADHD child, get your parenting as good as it can be. Mm-hmm. And if the child then still has problems with focus and follow through and organization planning and procrastination, impulse control, then it's important to treat it. Yeah. And there's so much controversy. Oh, I'd never give my child medicine. It's like, right. well, you give them medicine if they're a diabetic. You give them medicine if they had cancer. You give them medicine if they had heart disease. You know, if the brain's vulnerable, please think about it. Yeah. Right. How, this is like strictly out of curiosity, like at what age does like the feeling of like, anxiousness develop like what does that look like in young kids oh it can happen in babies okay that it'll it'll look like you know they'll be in distress yeah the 
Now, you don't want to just give in to the distress. The first thing you want to see if they can soothe themselves yeah. a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Don't let them cry all night. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, but try not to be intrusive with trying to fix things. Yeah. Mostly we're fixing our own anxiety or, you know, I'm a bad parent or they don't like me. They are six months old. It's yeah. like their brain isn't developed enough to have a big opinion. Yet. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No, that's so true. Yeah. I know. I think about that all the time. Well, not that, but just like, what are we going to do? Like when, you know, our baby's crying, like how are we going to, you know, how are we going to react to that? And uh, we, a little bit ago, we're talking about, we were watching a friend of ours give the speech and she is a very, like, she's a strong, independent, knows what she wants woman. And I'm like, so proud to call her a friend. And like, I looked at Taylor and I was like, how do we, I want to raise my girls. If we have girls to be like that. Like I started panicking about like, how do I, like, I really want to make sure that my girls are, you know, independent, that they're strong, like they're able to express what they want. And I feel like I've learned a bit more about like how to. Who and what are you talking about? Allie. Raisman. Oh, oh, got it, got it, got it. Um, Allie Raisman, the U.S. Olympic gymnast. She's a friend of ours, but she, we were watching a speech she gave and she's just, mm -hmm. she's just a, she's a great human, but she is so articulate and she is so strong. And I was like, I want my girls to be like her yeah. one day. So I feel like I'm a little more. I feel like there's hope. I feel like I can read that book and I can have a little bit <laughs> less stress on me because that makes me anxious. But I but, was... but the anxiety. So you really, it's important to deal with that yeah. so you don't end up overcompensating and doing too much. Yeah. And that's the beautiful part about love and logic. It's yeah. like, you know, if Chloe didn't bring her homework to school, there's no way Tana would have brought it to her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And she forgot it like twice. Yeah. Um, if it was cold out and Chloe didn't bring a sweater, Hannah wouldn't bring her the sweater mm -hmm. because you only have to be cold once to have that memory. Yeah. If, so she wouldn't rescue her. And one of the big ahas in the book, but also with parenting with love and logic is let children make affordable mistakes mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they learn from them. Yeah. If you rescue them, um, they won't. And then they'll become entitled and entitled people are never happy. Yeah. I love that affordable mistake. Yeah. Um, I just thought of this and I'm curious if you have a suggestion for it, but let's say there is like one parent that is wanting to make a change in their parenting style and the other one is not wanting to make that change. What, what would your advice be to the parent that is wanting to? change i see this all the time okay. and it happens a lot with divorced families yeah and you do what you can do yeah and and nudge but don't push yeah because if you push so many people i don't know if we've ever talked about brain types but uh, through my brain imaging work there's 16 different brain types and there's one type that if you say, hey, let's go do this, immediately say, no, I don't want to. Mm -hmm. Right there, automatically going to say no. So how you approach those people is in the opposite. Yeah. It's like, oh, I learned about this really great program, but you probably wouldn't want to know about it. <laughs> you have to start with, you probably wouldn't want to do it. Yeah. In order, you know, it's just their brain is not developed much beyond two. Because remember, two-year-olds are just naturally oppositional. Yeah. This part of their brain, the part that says no, develops, is myelinated before the sort of more thoughtful brain. Yeah. And is that why <laughs> kids are so good at saying no? Like every, like our nephew, like, you know, everybody, every two-year-old I know. Yeah. No. There's, right. No. 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 No is the answer to everything. Yeah. I don't want to kiss. Then they have to kiss you, right? But if you go, here, give me a kiss. No, I'm not giving you a kiss. <laughs> but I don't want one. Then all of a sudden they have to do it. It's a Garden of Eden thing all over yeah. again. <laughs> don't go to the tree. The next scene, they're at the tree. Yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. 
yeah. to think of. Yeah. Right? That's a fun no, fact. no, to everything. Yeah. And they'll even say no, you know, like they'll say no even if they do want something. They just like yeah. want want to say no. Yeah. And they're like, okay, I actually want it. <laughs> yeah. No. And that's why asking the second time is often good because you get beyond their automatic response. The other thing that's really good in families, rules, mm. right? Society has rules. Families, I think, should have rules. Not too many. I had a patient who had obsessive compulsive disorder, had 108 rules posted on the fridge. I'm like, no, it's a little over the top. Oh I'm like, like, no more than eight. Yeah. But, you know, simple things like tell the truth. Yeah. Put things away. You take out. Do what mom and dad say the first time. It's my favorite rule. Mm. Because if you tell a child to do something more than five times, your chance of abusing that child goes way up. So my daughter, I have five of them, God punished me. Um, I have five sisters. So <laughs> anyways, you but paired. Caitlin, uh, who I just talked to this morning, who I adore, uh, the first response was no. And, or, you know, do it, do it now. <laughs> and she'd pose. And I just got really good at saying, I asked you once, if I ask you again, here's the consequence. I don't really care. It's up to you. But I'm really good at follow through. Mm -hmm. So she knows she's not going to work me. Yeah. Too many parents get worked because yeah. they love the children so much. But that's not really a sign of love. It's mm -hmm. a sign of weakness. Yeah. What was that stat you said about leads to abuse? If you tell a child to do something, more than five times your chance of abusing them goes up because you're furious and then what happens is you overreact and then you feel guilty so you don't react and you don't react and you don't react and pressure builds builds and then you explode right and so the trick is react appropriately right the first time, I mean, by the fifth time, I mean, you're so incensed by the disrespect yeah. that you can lose control. Right. That makes sense. And, you know, another thing we talk about in the book is when you don't know what to do, go, there's going to be a consequence. I have to think about it. I'll let you know what it is. Right. So good. Mm. <laughs> really ramps up the child's yeah. anxiety. And when we talk about anxiety... What we're trying to create is appropriate anxiety. Okay. Oh, People yeah. are like, anxiety is a bad thing. No, anxiety is an essential yeah. thing, right? If you're going to do a role, you, you have anxiety, so you go learn your lines, yeah. right? It's like, oh, no, I got to be prepared because you don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to let people down, whatever. It's, it's modulating the anxiety. There's a great study out of Stanford. They looked at... 1,548 10-year-old children in 1921. Mm -hmm. And then they evaluated them every 10 years for 90 years, looking at what goes with health, success, and longevity. And what they found was the low-anxiety people, mm -hmm. the don't-worry-be-happy people, mm -hmm. died the earliest what? from accidents and preventable illnesses. Oh, gosh. The conscientious people, which means they sort of live with, on a scale of zero to 100, 15 to 20% anxiety. I just want to do the right thing. I want to be on time. I want to do what I say. I'll get this deadline done a little bit early. It doesn't consume you, but it's there. But it's there. Yeah. To just sort of get yeah. your life going in the direction you choose. People who have low levels of anxiety go to jail because like if I get a thought, oh, I think I'm going to rob the grocery store. My next thought is right. you don't like institutional food. Right. It's like you could get caught. Don't do that. Right. But when your brain doesn't even allow you to think about that, you just do it. Right. Wow. And they actually, people who go to jail have slower heart rates and lower sweat gland activity and lower frontal load. Wow. activity so appropriate anxiety and you know some i don't know about you guys but i know i behaved in part so 
my mother or father wouldn't throw something at me or be angry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. We had um, this guy, Dr. Ross Marin on and he, uh, we talked all about like stress and anxiety and he was like, stress is like a healthy level of stress mm. is good. Like you need that. And it was just really eye opening because we talk about, you know, you know, struggle with anxiety and we struggle with these things, but you know, not letting that define you and turning it in a way that is actually like good and can motivate you, you know, to learn yeah. the lines, whatever it may be. Yeah. It's well, and reminder. part of that comes, you know, if you get your homework done early, you're less stressed. Yeah. Right. If you're conscientious, but also in the book, we talk a lot about very practical strategies, like not teaching children not to believe every stupid thing they think. Mm -hmm. I call it killing the ants, the automatic negative thoughts. I wrote a book actually for children called Captain Snout and the superpower questions. I love that book mm. is like for five, six, seven year olds, teach them not to believe everything they think yeah. thoughts are powerful. And it's really not the thoughts you have that make you suffer. It's the thoughts you attach to that make you suffer. And if you yeah. just carry this question around in your head, is that true? I absolutely know that that's true. Uh, I love the work of Byron Katie. She has a book, my favorite book called Loving What Is. And uh, it's basically whenever you feel sad, mad, nervous, or out of control. So if a child comes home, it's like, oh, I'm really sad. Or I'm really anxious. It's like, well, let's write it down. Tell me what you're thinking. And then just take it through a process I talk about in the book that starts with, is that really true? Do you absolutely know that that's true? Mm -hmm. Did you touch on this? Um, I know in, in your new book, you talk about mental hygiene. H have we touched on what that is and who should be practicing it? All of us. So March 10th. <laughs> had a feeling that was going to be the answer. <laughs> 2020, March 10th, 2020. My book, The End of Mental Illness, had just come out the week before. And I was in my office at home getting ready to go to the airport to go to New York City. So if you remember, that's the epicenter of COVID. Oh, yes. And and I remember that night writing down mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hands. Uh, we need to disinfect our thoughts so we don't have to believe every storm that your brain creates. Yeah. And so mental hygiene, start every day with today is going to be a great day. Push your brain every day. Today is going to be a great day. When you make decisions throughout the day, is it good for my brain or bad for it? Is it good for my brain or bad for it? Because if you love yourself, you're going to choose good. And when you go to bed at night, perhaps my favorite thing, my favorite mental hygiene habit is to clean the day, which is I go to bed and I say a prayer and then I go, what went well today? And I'm serious. Like I start at the beginning of the day and I go hour by hour looking for even the smallest thing. We've had this tragedy at home. I was telling you a little bit about it. My mother-in-law got diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And uh, I remember, and it's been stressful, just walking up the stairs and grabbing Tana's hand because it's actually helped us even be closer. And that made the highlight real at night because it yeah. was just a very tender moment in a dark time. And I remember the day my dad died was about three and a half years ago. And I've been doing this what went well exercise for more than 10 years. And that was like one of the worst days of my adult life, if not the worst day. Yeah. And when I, my head hit the pillow, I said a prayer and then I went, what went well? And I'm like, seriously, we're doing that today? Yeah. But because it's my habit, the brain is lazy. The brain does what you allow it to do. I did it. And I remembered some just really funny, touching moments in that day. And I went to sleep. Wow. And it didn't mean I didn't grieve. Yeah. I still grieve. Yeah. But I'm managing my mind rather than my mind's torturing me. 
Yeah. And it's a process and it occurs over time. Wow. That's really powerful. Yeah. Um, what is, I'm just curious to know, what is like your biggest hope for this book? Goal, hope, dream, who it reaches. So I love this book so much and I live the content for throughout my whole sort of child psychiatry career. Yeah. There's, there's not a manual for parenting, right? You just bring the child home from the hospital and nobody gives yeah. you a manual. Scary. My hope is, is the instruction manual that should have came with your child. That's cool. Yeah. It's so, true. yeah, it's true. Like I, my dad has told me the story several times of the day that they brought me home from the hospital and that moment of walking through the front door with me in their arms and going, whoa, I am in, I am responsible for another being's life. Like, what are we supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to terrify. He, he said it was the most scared he's ever been in his life. I felt the most human when I had my first child. Well, I adopted my first child. But okay. having him in my life, I, I just felt like things were not just about me yeah. anymore. Um, and it was wonderful and awful. So <laughs> wonderful and awful. Um, he gets a shout out in the book. Um, one of the major principles in the book that also helps adult relationships is mm -hmm. notice what you like about your kids way more than what you don't like. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he was hard for me. So I adopted him. He tended to be oppositional and argumentative, that brain type that mm -hmm. no matter what you said, he'd then say the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I was in my training and I did my child psychiatry training in Hawaii and I miss Hawaii every day. I love that place so much. Um, and my supervisor said, it was basically the precursor, the special time. It's like, you need to spend more time. With him. And I took him to a place called Sea Life Park. I don't know if you guys ever went in there, but it's on Oahu. And we went to the dolphin show and that was fun. And the killer whale show and the sea lion show. And it was all awesome. But at the end of the day, he grabbed my shirt and he said, I want to see Fat Freddy. And I'm like, who's Fat Freddy? He's seven, my son. And it's a penguin show. And they had one more penguin show. So we get into this stadium and this little, fat, humble penguin comes on the stage, looks around, so you know he's sort of full of himself, climbs a ladder to a high diving board, goes to the end of the board, bounces, and then jumps in the water. And I'm like, whoa. Gets out of the water, bowls with his nose, counts with his flipper, jumps through a hoop of fire. I'm completely blown away by this little bird. <laughs> Have my arm around my son, we're bonding, it's a good day. And then the trainer asked Freddie to go get something. Freddie went and got it, and he brought it right back. And at that moment, time stood still for me. Because in my head, I'm like, I asked this kid to get something for me. And he wants to have a discussion for like 20 minutes. And then he doesn't want to do it. And I knew my son was smarter than the, the penguin. penguin. And so I went up to the trainer afterwards with Anthony next to me. And I'm like, how did you get Freddie to do all these really cool things? And she said, she looked at my son and then she looked at me and she said, I'm like, parents, whenever Freddie does anything like what I want him to do, I notice him. I give him a hug and I give him a fish. Mm. And the light went on in my head that even though my son didn't like raw fish, <laughs> my daughter actually does. Chloe loves sushi. So it would have worked. <laughs> great for her <laughs> not for him um I, I was i was like my own dad i wasn't paying attention to him when he did good things i paid attention to him when he was being bad right because i didn't want to raise bad kids so i was things. inadvertently giving him the wrong kind of attention right. so i collect penguins i have almost two thousand of them it's very weird um to remind myself to notice the good things about the people in my life more than the bad things. Yeah. And what do you think would have happened if Freddie had a bad day and the trainer got a stick 
and beat the penguin. He never performed for her again because he would have raised the rage and the anxiety which would have shut him down. But so often, you know, parents get angry at children and do not have thoughtful responses, which can create all sorts of trouble. Now, as parents, all of us have made mistakes. All of us have had thoughts we don't really want or had behavior we didn't really think was smart. Um, So forgiveness is important. But overall, if you're noticing what you like. So if you have clear goals, you're bonded. They're rules. You don't get into tantrums. You notice what you like more than what you don't. Yeah. Kids will become mentally strong. Yeah. It's great advice for anybody in all relationships of life too. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's so good. Well, we're going to leave a link to your book, everyone. Go check it out. I'm yeah. probably going to read it and Learn some advice about my marriage. I could probably help in there. Um, but thank you so much for coming back. This has been so fun. We love getting to see you and spending time with you. Well, thank you for having me. I am deeply honored. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lemon Drops, for tuning in with us for another week. Uh, we are so thankful to have you guys along with us on this journey. We sure are. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe if you can see me in this camera right here. And if you're listening to my lovely, sometimes annoying voice, be sure to click follow. No. Annoying? Follow, Never. like, subscribe, swipe up, swipe down, bop it, twist it, pull it. <laughs> and with that, we will see you next week. I love you. <laughs> Great. It's bueno. It's bueno, puppy. Do you like your chair? One for mommy, one for daddy, one for Rim Rim. This podcast has been brought to you by Podcast Nation.